thank you, Devan, uh, Devan I'm sorry, uh, for accepting this talk, this first talk in the morning. Um, I'm hoping we have a great talk. So um, let me introduce you to our viewers. So uh, Ian Deval joined the University of Bordeaux in southwest of France in 93 as an assistant professor, focusing on the design of analog ICs, RF ICs, and high-speed mixed signal ICs, and also high, reliable, high, high reliability electronics. So um, he pursues his researchers within the IMS, which is a laboratory of integration for material to system. And in 99, he became an associate professor and in 2004, a full professor. Um, from 2006 to 2010, he was the head of IC design group. And from 2011 to 16, the head of devices, circuits and systems department. Since 2016, uh, Dr. Deval is the director of IMS, which means um, that IMS is a public research laboratory with 150 PhD students and 150 faculties, which is a huge <laughs> research laboratory. Um, so thank you so much, Ian, for accepting our invitation. Um, please, um, you can start with everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for introducing this presentation. And uh, Thank you to uh, my colleagues at the Université Fédérale de Rio Grande do Sul for inviting me today for this, uh, for this talk. That's uh, really a pleasure and an honor for me to be able to uh, talk a little bit about what we have done and what we are currently doing in uh, radiation hardening by design circuits for space application. This work that I will propose you today has been uh, made by myself, of course, but not only. No one is doing something by his own. So it's also um, it's also a work that has been done by my friends and colleagues, Hervé Lapouillade and François Rivet at the University of Bordeaux, IMS Research Laboratory and Bordeaux ENP, uh, together with uh, the French CNRS, uh, French institution. So the talk today is about radiation learning by design and CMOS integrated circuits applicated for space electronics. So what we are going to talk about today is about the motivation of what are we doing that, actually, because it's important before starting to talk about what we are doing, why are we doing that? And then we will talk about uh, the space radiation effect. Uh, there is two kinds of space radiation effect we should be uh, of, uh, aware of. The first one is about cumulative dose. That is the accumulation of dose during the time. It's a long time process. And the other one is a transient single event effect. And this one is just instantaneous. It arrived once and disappeared then after. Both of them got troublesome for the electronics, for the human beings as well, but we will talk about that at the very end because um, it's also about uh, the issue of uh, uh, the human being using this electronic. If the electronics is efficient and the human being is dead, is, there is absolutely no interest. Uh, then after we will talk about the radiation hardening of those circuits for uh, the cumulative effect, the, the, the total ionizing dose. Uh, we will talk about the voltage reference and then operational amplifiers, that's two examples uh, that I will show you. And then we will focus on single event effects, uh, mostly is talking about memory mapping. And at the very end, uh, I will conclude this talk and I will be more than happy to answer any question and discuss with the people looking at this presentation on YouTube. So let's start with the motivation of, of uh, radiation hardening by design. So the, the hardening of uh, circuit, uh, integrated circuit has been renewed uh, quite recently because we discovered just a little bit more than 10 years ago India sent uh, her very first mission to Moon, and uh, that name was Chandraya-1, uh, and uh, it was just sending something to Moon to see if we can find water. And uh, it was successful. For the very first time, uh, we discover, India discovered for the humanity, water uh, mostly at the pole, but doesn't really have any impact. There is water on the Moon. Um, not lake or river like we can see on, on, on Earth, obviously, because the temperature is not the same, but you can find ice which is available on Moon. And this is really critical because uh, water is absolutely mandatory when it comes to life. And finding water in the Moon allows us to think about long-term lunar orbitation. 
it become possible because nowadays we have to bring water to the moon and if we can go there and find water on the moon then we can stay on the moon and it open a lot of perspective among which the most famous at this time is the exploration of mars the mars planet uh, because it's much easier to start from the moon than to start from earth to go and and, and explore mars because there is a lack of gravity and um, then after the, the the cost of energy to go from the moon to the mars is much lower than the one to go from Earth to Mars. So um, most likely the exploration of Mars will start from the Moon. And that the fact that we can do that, thanks to water, is due to what the, the Indian colleagues have been done just 12 years ago. Uh, and also, uh, we have seen that uh, the Chinese uh, people send also what they call Cheng Yi for. It's moon landers, and that moon landers allow us also to know a little bit more about the dark side of the moon. Uh, we know a lot about the dark side of the moon thanks to Pink Floyd, but it was a long time ago, and it's not really scientific. So we have sent this uh, lunar probe. Uh, this lunar probe land on 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 the dark side of the moon, as we can see here. It has been uh, lunar that, that have connection with a satellite, relay satellite, because it's on the dark side of the moon, so there is no connection. And this one allows us to connect to the Earth. And then there is a little rover, that little rover, the U2, no connection with uh, the, the, the high Irish group, neither. But anyway, um, it, it analyzes and photographs the lunar surface. And we can see here a picture of U2 done by uh, the lunar probe itself. And uh, uh, our Chinese colleagues definitely make the demonstration that something can be done on the dark side of the moon. And if you add the dark side of the moon plus water, definitely the exploration of Mars become really something which is serious uh, nowadays. It was not feasible just two or three years ago because this uh, dark side of the moon discovery has been done just only one year from now. So uh, there is a bottleneck. And the bottleneck is that the space environment is very unfriendly. When I said very, it is a killer. It is a problem that we got our sun. Our sun is just here. And he project a lot of high energy particles because it's a nuclear relation here. He sends everything everywhere. And of course, it sends that also to moon. And uh, we are protected, thanks God, we are protected by our atmosphere and also some magnetic fields. But no, those magnetic fields are not perfect. And we can see that here there is a hole. And if those particles make the turn, we'll see the boil or uh, events uh, on the pole. And that's improved that there's a lot of energy. It can unite. There is a ionization of, 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 of the atmosphere and things like that. So these particles arrive from everywhere. We are protected from um, those particles by our atmosphere. When you are on Earth, but when you are on the space, then those particles are no longer filtered, and they will definitely strike both the electronic and the human being when he will travel from Earth to Mars. That's a problem that we will talk about. So uh, this uh, protection definitely uh, is not available on space, and it directly affects electronics. It, it, direct, it, it affects electronics on different way. But let's say let's talk about those two major way, which are cumulative uh, total ionizing diode dose and transient single event effect, space radiation effect that comes with uh, uh, the electronics when it's in the space. So the relation effects are usually separate in two parts. The first one is cumulative effect. The second one is transient effect. The cumulative effect is the fact that the circuit is uh, uh, suffering radiation effect from the sun and from elsewhere, but mostly from the sun, and it accumulates those particles. And uh, of course, the total ionizing diode, TID, is uh, uh, dependent on the dose you receive on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes it's high dose, sometimes it's low dose and blah, blah, blah. So at the integration of that, create a dose which is stored by the integrated circuit. So the problem is that this effect is permanent, not exactly permanent, because they can be solved by unpowered 
the circuits and then it can take months to recover a little bit. So this effect is not really permanent, but it's almost permanent. And it will degrade the characteristic of transistors. And uh, that, of course, will have mostly an impact on analog integrated circuits, uh, not really on digital one. But the second one, the one which is about transient effect, this one is due to single event effect. It came from a high energy particle, a single one that arrived at random. Nobody knows where, nobody knows no, where, no. It will arrive once and it will have so much energy that we will go across everything, including, of course, our circuits. And it will generate a current at place that are not at all expected to receive a current of any kind. So it can be destructive when it comes to single event latch up it can create a short circuit between the power supplies and this will definitely make the silicon to, 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 to destroy itself, uh, to melt. And uh, that's a real problem. It can also be uh, uh, unlocalized. You don't know where it will come and you don't know when. That's a problem. So you cannot prepare yourself to protect yourself of those events. They will arrive, whatever you are taking care of. Uh, and those ones are mostly critical for digital IC because they are transient. So when they arrive, they create a problem. And if it's for analog, of course, at a given moment, after a couple of times, the analog circuit will recover. When it comes to digital, you can change a bit from a zero to one or one to zero. And then this will be stored in a memory. And this transient effect will become permanent. And it will create some really, really trouble with, with digital IC. Not so critical with analog, really critical with digital. So uh, the problem is that uh, um, circuits today are mixed signal. They are both analog and digital. So when it comes to those kind of new and modern circuits, either cumulative or transient radiation effect dramatically affect the functionality of a given IEC. Uh, they can yield to both malfunction, which is a problem, but then after you can correct that, system permanent failure, which is another issue, and even system destruction. It can definitely collapse the overall satellite. That's a problem because it's, we are talking about billions of dollars here. So let's talk about the total dose, total dose effect summaries. So there is two problems that came with total dose. So there is particles everywhere and some of them are stored within the field oxide. And here you can see a view of a transistor. This is a, 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 a top view of this transistor with the source, the gate, the drain, and this one is a side view with the polygon gate and the substrate and the field oxide. And here is a transistor. So there is positive charge that are stored within the field oxide. Oxide. They should not be here normally, but they arrive because of those radiation effects, and they generally appear from here to here, they will increase the leakage current. Even if the transistor is supposed to be off, it will conduct through those charges which are trapped within the oxide. And the other one, those who are under the gate, they will prepare, they will pre-tune a channel within the transistor. So they will shift the uh, uh, inversion voltage, which means that they will shift the threshold voltage of a given transistor. So as a summarizing, you can say that if you are talking about before radiation, you will have these curves. Then because of the increase of, of leakage current, this floor will rise. And because of the shift of threshold, this transistor will conduct before. And at the very end, the curve of after radiation will be this one instead of this one. And of course, this will change everything because it will change the biasing of a given circuit. And because of this unbiased or moved bias, everything will be in trouble. So the threshold, the threshold is shifted. The threshold is shifted. And unfortunately, because it's due to positive charge mostly, this unbalanced shift is observable between NMOS and PMOS. So there is a change in the NMOS transistor that will conduct easier, let's say, uh, faster, and the PMOS will less conduct. Uh, so the opposite, they will reduce the noise merging of digital IC. One good thing, and we will take care, advantage of that in, in, in the coming slide, is that this 
shift of threshold voltage is independent on the transistor dimension. Of course, it's independent of this transistor dimension because it's only due to the charge that are located within the gate oxide. So it's no longer linked to W or L, it's only linked to how much time did you spend this transistor within the, the space environment. And we will take advantage of that to make it a little bit less sensitive to radiation. The single event effect is a little bit different. It just came from one single very high energy particle, what we call an AV ion. The AV ion is here. It arrives with a lot of energy. It will cross everything, including metals and things like that, and will go through the IC. And if it cross an NP junction with the depleted region, it will create electron holes all around its trajectory. As those electron holes, because of the field which is available in the depleted region, will create a current that will combine uh, the, the hole which goes on the direction and the electrons on the other one. So it will create something which is very close to a photocurrent on a diode which is inversely biased, of course. So um, it, it's, it will definitely uh, be due to a single ionizing particle, which is a problem because you cannot predict where this particle will strike. And uh, the pin junction will be more effective effective to, to collect those electron holes created if it is uh, inversely biased. We mean that the current will arrive uh, in inversely biased junction more than directly biased junction. It will arrive also with directly biased junction, but not that much. So it's like a photocurrent from a designer point of view. It is not photocurrent. It is not due to photon, but it is exactly like that. You will have this kind of photocurrent appearing on a diode on the opposite side of the diode logical current direction. So uh, now let's talk about what can we do with all those problems coming from space. First, let's concentrate ourselves on, on total dose. So let's talk about a voltage reference, which is needed everywhere in every single chip. So uh, the first time when you want to make a voltage reference, you want this reference to be independent of time. So you need to create something which is no longer linked to temperature. There is nothing that is uh, independent uh, to temperature in electronics. you got things that are directly dependent and those who are complementary dependent. And the idea here, like it is done in every band gap circuit, is to make a summation of something which is directly proportional to temperature from, with something which is complementary proportional to temperature. And if you are Balancing both of them, the summation will be independent of temperature. The TC0 will be obtained with a temperature coefficient positive, summing to temperature coefficient negative. TC0 is TC++, TC minus. So uh, what we can do is to generate this complementary to absolute temperature, relying on the shift of threshold voltage. Uh, this is done here with this transistor, M1 and M2. They will be made of different side in terms of length. And the length of a given transistor has a second order effect on the threshold. So if you can change the length of the transistor, you will have different threshold for both M1 and M2. It's much efficient to do that. You can also use a dual VT technology, but if you use a dual VT technology, the temperature dependence of the technology will not be the same for both the transistor. Here, we're just using a some other effect, which is using the length of the transistor to shift a little bit, just a little bit, but enough, the, sh the, the threshold voltage of this transistor to make it uh, different from, from one from the other, and then after to create a complementary to absolute temperature. So those two transistors are made different. The length of M1 is made a little bit larger than the length of F2, which means that the threshold voltage of T1, transistor 1, will be a little bit higher than one of transistor 2. And that's enough to then after uh, consider that you also here have two transistors that are shorted with their gate and shorted with their source, which means that the current, and not to mention the aspect ratio are the same, the current within M5 and M6, which namely are I2, and I1 are the same because those transistors are in parallel. And then uh, if you consider that we here work on having the same aspect ratio, which means W over L for both transistors are the same. 
As I said previously, L1 and L2 are not the same. So W1 and W2 have to be not the same as well to unbalance the unbalance of L1 and L2. But if we are able to do that, it is quite easy to do so. Since both the current that shows this transistor are the same, then the overdrive transistor voltage will be the same because the overdrive transistor directly linked to the current. So then we can write the overdrive transistor VGS1 minus VT1 is equal to VGS2 minus VT2. Uh, so the shift is not that much high, but it's enough for uh, uh, adding a transist a resistance here, R1, across those two VGS. And then it yields us to this current, which is directly the difference between VGS1 minus VGS2 above R1, and which is just VT1 minus VT2 above R1. And this is due to the fact that we have a, a little shift within the threshold voltage of those transistors because of the length dimension that has been changed. And if we do so, which is really amazing, it's that we are natively ordinate because we no longer depend on the threshold voltage itself. We just depend on the difference of them. So the VT shift, as we have said previously, is independent of the transistor dimension. We talked about that just a couple of slides before. And because of this independence, as soon as we are making a difference between two thresholds, which is due to the size of the transistors, there is no longer an effect about the shift. Both VT1 and VT2 will shift of the same amount, which means that the delta between both of them will be independent of the radiation level the circuit received. So doing so, transistor system will be ordinate with regard to total dose. And this really is made for almost free. But it's not enough. We also need a proportional to attempt absolute temperature current generator to submit to the complementary proportional to make it independent to temperature. This is done with the classical uh, Bob Widler uh, proposed in bipolar in, back in the 70s, uh, the, the, the famous Widler band gap generator. And we just make the same things here. But to work, you need to have the transistor to work with an exponential characteristic, not uh, uh, um, <coughs> sorry not a quadratic one. So you have to bias your transistor uh, on sub-threshold uh, region. <coughs> on the sub-threshold region, those transistors are exponential and the Wheeler approach will work as well. So we first have a current mirror on the top, which impose that I3 and I4 the current in the branch on the left and the right are the same. Second, we have those transistor, which is a Wheeler mirror equivalent. M26 is made eight times larger than M25. And so we can write that the current I3 or I4, we call it IPTAT, is directly expressed as N times PTH. PTH here is a thermal voltage, KT over Q, divided by R3 because R3 is available here. And the Nippon logarithm of eight, because this one is eight times this one. So here we can see that once again, we are not using anything else but the thermal voltage, which is independent of radiation. So VT is VT, the threshold voltage is not used at all. So once again, IPTAT is added as well as ICPTAT was previously. So if you can make the summation of both of them, you will have a TC0 voltage difference. And here it is. You just have your IPTAT here your ICTAT here. You use a relationship between those transistors to have a kind of gain to make the summation of both of them because normally the PTAT is smaller than the CTAT, so you have to increase a little bit the EPTAT to balance it. And then you will recover here something which is independent of temperature and which is also independent at the first order to radiation. So it yields us to the overall chip, which is a little bit awful, but let me show you where we are doing that. Here you find once again the CPT, the CTAT current generator with those two transistors balanced due to the lengths which are not balanced. This one is the Widler equivalent we just seen before. This one is a summation with the G being the gain between the PTAT and the CTAT. And this one is the operational transconductance amplifier that guarantee that VDS will be the same for M1 and M2 
So, and then you need some startup circuit because as I mentioned previously, this circuit is independent of the voltage supply. And uh, as usually you got two uh, DC point, the one we want and zero. So you want to avoid any kind of circuit to have zero current. So because of that, you need to have two startup circuit. This one would create a, a voltage, which is equal to three times a VGS. And then one, two, three, once again. So it will introduce a little bit of current within it. And then it will go to the second order, uh, the second operating point, which will cut off M27 after startup. This one is another story. It will generate three VGS and then it will drive M36 in its linear region and it's connected to VA. So it will create this transistor to become uh, uh, directly uh, connecting a lot of current, which will start up everything. And then after it will rise its voltage here to VREF and VREF will connect M37 and M37 will shot M36 which will make the startup circuit to live his own life and everything to work correctly without any more, any dual operating point uh, problems. So we can guarantee that this circuit will work on the operating point we want and not a zero operating point. So this is the way it has been implemented in a technology which is a low cost technology, a 130 nanometer from techno technology CMOS from ST Microelectronics. This technology is a real low cost one very mature, very, very, uh, very efficient. So you can see the, we design actually two layouts. You can have here the operational amplifier, here the trestle circuit reference in the PT, so, so between the CTAT, PTAT, and some resistor network, make the summation and things like that. What is amazing is the transistor here. You can design like that. So M1 and M2 got different length. Here is the length, here are W. And you can also make them this way. They got the same length, the same W, but different length. And you make the summation of W with M2 being several times to be sure that the aspect ratio of M1 over M2 will be the same. So two different layouts. One is based on uh, uh, the classical analog way of designing, which is uh, guaranteeing that you will have a little dispersion of production. And the other one is, of course, much smaller in terms of silicon footprint, but the pairing of those transistors is much more different. So when it comes to measurement, here are the measurements. You can see that we make a radiation of those circuits. As we will see then after, there is two radiation dose that has been used. But at the very end, we depose a dose of 40 kilo rad and 150 kilo rad for both chip at one low dose rate and one high dose rate with the layout of uh, the circuit without sharing and the circuit with a lot of transistors very similar. And we can see that the layout is of major importance. Here is a shift with regard to the voltage. It's lower than 1%, even with very, very high dose rate. And it stays like that even after annealing, while the other one, they are definitely shifted from 8% to 15%, which is still acceptable, but anyway, it's much more than 1%. And after a little, as I told you, it's not a permanent effect. It starts to anneal a little bit. It starts to becoming better, but they definitely suffer um, not that much, 10%. It's still acceptable. But if you work on that, the layout can make it lower than 1%. So layout is really, really critical. Not only the design and the, the topology of the circuit is of important. The layout also, like in any analog circuit, is also critical. So like make a little bit of comparison with component of the shell, the one that you can find on the market. So we, as I told you previously, we use two dose rates. One is 310 red per hour, the other one 650. So we, dip, we depose uh, 40K and 150K, and we observe a shift of 0.4 and 0.5% about this uh, reference voltage. And if you see what is done with classical circuit from the, the, the market, one from Texas and the other one from National, you have dramatically, it's still good, but it's it's worse. And, and they are using something which is in between close to 500 watt per hour, which is a little bit high if you compare to space radiation effect, but still acceptable. And the final one, which is made by ST Microelectronics, this one has been uh, suffering a very low dose rate, which is worst 
than, than the high dose rate and, and it's really efficient. But this one is in bipolar technology. And we all know that bipolar technology are by native uh, uh, condition more robust than CMOS because they are less relying on charge which are trapped on oxide, while the most transistors definitely rely on that. So uh, the bipolar transistor are more robust by nature, but since then we can have something which is finally very similar with doing that CMOS transistor with, with the radiation uh, by design hardening. So let's talk a bit about an operational amplifier right now. So this operational amplifier has been made hardened with regard to radiation because of the topology, not the circuit, but the topology. We use a continuous time auto zero operational amplifier. This is the one that we designed here. This is continuous time, which means that V plus and V minus are permanently connected to the main amplifier, which means that if you put a triangle on top of that, this can be used as an operational amplifier without consideration, like the one you should take care of when you are using shorter amplifiers. This one is continuous time auto zero amplifier. It can be used as a replacement of any kind of operational amplifier as you can find in, 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 the, in the market, in the literature. So this is natively independent of radiation because the impact of radiation will be a shift of the offset. You will change the transistor threshold, so you will change the offset, and if you change the offset, you will change the biasing of the operational amplifier and its characteristics. So, so if you are able to mule the offset, then your circuits will be radiation hardened by nature. So this is why we use this circuit. So the two trend, the two amplifiers that I use in the continuous time auto zero are the same. We have this classical, let's say, operational amplifier, low voltage with a, a rail to rail input, as we can see here, and a rail to rail output as well. There is a unity gain compensation to allow this uh, operational amplifier to be a general purpose one. Then you got a, a biasing tree that allows the summation of the current from the differential pair, either if you are sensing the ground or sensing the VDD. And then you make the differentiation and the pre-biasing of the class AB output. The addition is here, you got the auxiliary input pair. This input pair will unbalance the current of the principal input pair, which will allow you to control the offset of this input pair. So um, if you look at the way it works, actually. So first, phase one, you will short the nulling amplifier. I remind you that both the main and nulling are the same. So you will first short the first one. So it is shorted on its own offset. And then you make a feedback loop to change the value of the auxiliary pair. And then you make a feedback here. And if you select correctly the negative feedback, it will have an equilibrium at which this offset will be compensated with the gain of the nulling amplifier. And then this shorted input with this shorted feedback will generate a nulling amplifier that self-compensates its own offset. So when this phase one is done, the offset of the nulling amplifier is not exactly zero. It is its own offset divided by its gain. And its gain is quite large, so it's very close to zero. And of course, this compensation value are stored within CN compensator transistor, uh, sorry, capacitors here. And on the second step now, phase two. Nowadays, with phase two, we are opening the newling amplifier for him to sense the input of the main amplifier, as you can see here and here. And you also send the output of this newling amplifier to the compensation entry of the main amplifier. Because he got an almost zero offset, and he sends the offset of the main, it will make the difference between his own offset zero and the offset of the main, and will send the compensation. And the balance will be obtained when the offset of the main will copy the one of the nulling, which is almost zero. So doing so, the main OPA copies the offset of the nulling amplifier, which has been uh, canceled during phase one. And of course, the main amplifier is always functional because those two inputs are always connected. 
So you can use it like a regular operation amplifier. You don't have to take care about the frequency at which phase one and phase two are done uh, by the circuit itself. So that's really of interest because then after the offset of the overall system is supposed to be nulled. And if it is zeroed, then after it will be radiation hardened. So let's see the layout of this circuit. So you can see here that you got the nulling amplifier and the main amplifier, they are both the same as I told you previously. This one has been compensated for uh, open unity gain for a reason of general purpose. Only the main has been done, of course. The switches that make the policy between the main and nulling phase one and phase two. And of course, the clock generator will generate automatically the clock to cancel everything without any additional comp component to make it a standalone operation. This one also was done with the classical 130 nanometer technology from ST Microelectronics. And as I told you, it's fully integrated because it got an, an uh, embedded clock generator. So you can use it as it arrives. And let's see what arrives when you put it under radiation effect and uh, the measurement of is also. So due to the approach we design, you can see that this is the measurement of the continuous time auto zero system. So it starts close to one microvolt of offset. You irradiate it during 120, uh, 140 hours. I don't remember how much time, but a long time. So it doesn't change that much. Then after it starts moving a little bit. And uh, so it's almost stable and very close to one microvolt all around its lifetime. Some others are better than uh, our chip in terms of offset, but when they are irradiated, they are definitely suffering a lot. Then after, they go back to initial value because they are really enjoying some manning. But most of the others, they are really moving everywhere and they got an offset, even if it's still acceptable, this offset demonstrate that the, sh the, the IC suffered dramatically from the space environment he is living in. So what we have done here is a chip which is radiation hardened and provide a one microvolt, which is very low um, offset, which is regardless of the total ionizing diode that is used. It is independent of that almost because of the principle. As soon as the operational PFR is still having a little bit of gain, it will be able to work correctly. So that's really easy for us to use that as a replacement of standard low-cost operational amplifier um, to be used in, in satellite payload. So uh, let's focus a little bit now on single event effects. And uh, single event effects are mostly, as I told you previously, impacting the digital uh, electronics because it can shift from one to a zero. It's a particle strike that will affect memory. The memory will change from one to zero or zero to one, you just don't really know. And that's a problem. It's a problem if this memory got data because the data will be a faulty one. But it's even worse if this memory is within the, 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 the processor uh, stack because you can jump from one, when you are running a pro uh, an algorithm, a program, you can jump from one, uh, um, uh, operation to another one and normally you have a jump which is which which is based on the memory and this jump can be a wrong one if there is a shift and then you can have a bug and the circuit can be stuck in this bug forever and uh, this has been observed in the past for a satellite which was not able to open its battery collectors just because one something changed the program and it kills the satellite which is of course a cost of billions so that's really a problem Nowadays, the bit correction, uh, the, the way to counteract that in the past was to make some error detection, error correction. Uh, so you make a mapping of the, of, of the memory. But nowadays, it's a little bit more complex because the technology are becoming so teeny that when a strike arrives, it will not change just one byte. It will change more than that. We call that from single event upset to multiple event upset. It's just due to one single particle strike. But it can change just not only one bit, but more than that. And then it's very, very difficult to know if there is two bytes that are moving, you cannot detect easily the error. And then you can think that it's error free while there is just two errors that compensate one to the other. So it's really critical because of 
the, the, the smaller technology we are using today. And this, of course, will become worse and worse with the advancement of technology today. So uh, we propose here to counteract this multiple event accept, taking advantage of this uh, memory shrinking effect, which is here used as, as an asset instead of a problem. So we have to sense uh, to be sure that something arrived and to know when it arrived to correct it, because we don't know when it arrived, neither where it arrived. We have to sense the current of the memory, because if there is a peak of current at a moment which is not expected, it will mean that we are not writing or reading this memory. Something arrived out of the blue, and this is the SAU or MAU problem. So you need to smell and sense the power supply and the current of the memory, but you need to do that on permanent time and because the event will arrive at a moment you don't expect it. And uh, the problem is that the spike of current is very small. It's in the vicinity of 10 minus 12 seconds, or so, which means that you will need a circuit which is in the gigahertz range of, of bandwidth to smell if a current moves in this memory. And that's a problem because if you need a gigahertz bandwidth circuits worked on permanently, it will consume a lot. So this power consumption will become huge. And that's definitely not acceptable when it comes to satellite because the power you have is not forever. So um, the, the, the solution that was used previously is to have redundant memory. So you've got three memory. Once it's striked, and then you just use a voter and the the winner take all. So if two of them are saying it's a zero and the other one is saying it's a one, then it's a zero. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, one can obviously see that the storage capability of any kind of circuits with a given technology is dramatically reduced. And that's, of course, doesn't help us to provide the very high technology to the satellite and, uh, uh, technology. So um, we propose to move the problem to an advantage. So we want to enter if memory cell to sensitive uh, memory. So we add those phantom memory to the actual memory. And if a strike arrives, it will change, of course, the memory. But it will also change the sensor. And the sensor will consume zero because it's a memory cell. So it will just change. And we can see that it changed. And if it changed, we can expect that his neighbor change as well. Or if they don't change, at least we cannot really rely on them. So uh, this is a design by circuit level uh, topology, not, not really circuits, but circuit layout, actually. So you spatially interleaving those memory plants. Here are the data cells of your real memory plant, and those are unwanted memory cells. They are put in between, and uh, they are the same. So if they receive a strike, they will change their value. Uh, and then you can see uh, if the value of your interleaved memory has changed, you can be sure that the strike arrive in the vicinity of the memory you are considering and that no data available in the area are to be reliable. So uh, let's see a strike is arriving. It changed, for instance, in this example for a uh, little uh, memory uh, cell and two of them are the one we add. So we detect that they shift their value to something else. So it means that those we are surrounding are supposed to also be shifted. And then you have to be very careful. Either you can refresh the memory if it is data, and if it is a program, you have to restart your program. But this, of course, will make lose some time, but it will avoid any bug and, and any collapse of the system. So this memory is known as corrupt, and you can say that to everybody. So, and then after you take the measures that will allow you to take care of those problems with correction of the memory, with uh, a new data loading or a new program loading or whatever, uh, whatever let's say, uh, counteract pro process that you will use also in the classical uh, systems of, of, uh, of uh, redundancy. So the desynthesization of memory circuit is a simple approach because we are using the same memory point for both detection and data cells. Of course, if you can make the memory point, uh, the detection point more sensitive to the memory point, it will also be of interest because it will react more than the memory. But you have to be very careful because you don't have to react too rapidly neither. Because if he change his mind too rapidly, you can think that the memory has been hurt while it is not. 
Um, all the detections should have the same value, the easier being zero. So as soon as you can make a, 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 a you can make a synchronous, an asynchronous OR on all those data, and if this OR is one, which means that at least one change and there is a problem, then you can make a row and column identification to know what is the area that has been affected by a strike. And then after you can refresh the data cells in the vicinity of the activated detectors, and of course, put your detector bot in the detection mode of zero. So the advantage of the data approach is that it allows us to detect multiple event upsets quite easily. It reduces the power consumption with regard to other approach to almost zero. Uh, and it, of course, takes advantage of transistor on scaling because at this time, the smaller the transistor, the easier to interact uh, this um, phantom memory. Of course, the price to pay is also a reduction of the capacity of byte per square millimeter of silicon, but nothing came for free in this world. And we all know that. So let's go to the conclusion of this talk. And uh, um, conquering the space is supposed to be the future nowadays. The space is not at all a friendly environment. It's not good for electronics, but it's not good neither for humanity. So all the things I'm talking about, about electronics, which means that there is a change in data or there is a, it's, it's an irradiation of the circuits, they will irradiate the human beings as well. And unfortunately, if you are talking about a six months travel from Earth to Mars without the protection of the atmosphere anymore, those who will arrive in Mars and come back will definitely have cancer 100% sure. And they will certainly not survive from their visit to Mars. But this is another story. At least we can work on making electronics more uh, hard than it that we can do for human beings. Uh, so we all have to develop radar IC for this conquest. Uh, we have seen here a memory mapping. We have seen here a band gap reference. Well, not band gap reference, voltage reference. We have seen an operational amplifier. These are key building blocks. But all those traditional building blocks need to be redesigned with this objective of relation hardening and we have to make it with classical technology because hardening has to rely on design, not on technology as we have done in the past. Because if we do so, the price to pay will be much, too much, and it will not be feasible. And not to mention, it will also take time to qualify the technology for the industry. And then after, we will not be able to put in our satellite or in our vessel uh, the last advanced technology, which will, of course, be the PT. So we have to work on design, not on technology. And uh, for sure, uh, the layout also has to be taken into account. We have seen that in a previous example. Uh, not only the schematic has to be taken into account, but also the layout. And this is brand new to take care of the layout in digital as well. This is something most of the time you don't do because you are using an automatic layout generators, but if you want to make it radiation hardened by layout, this is something we have to talk about in the future. So to conquer the future, the space, that's the future, but it's definitely dependent on the human being. And this is the conclusion of my talk, and I want to thank you all for your kind attention, and I'm ready to answer any kind of question you may have to me. Thank you, Ian. What a great talk. Um, I have a few questions of my own, and we also have a few questions on the chat. So I'll start with the chat, and let me try and bring it to the screen. The first question is on slide 12. So Juan Pablo asks um, that he noticed that your design is based on transistors without halo implants. So his question is, do you think channel engineering improves or worsens circuit performance due to radiation. Can you make it again? Um, yeah, he, has, um, he says that, do you think channel engineering improves or worsens circuit performance due to radiation? Channel engineering, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean by channel engineering? Uh, he's asking about halo implants. Oh yeah, oh. Um, oh. <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know exactly if it will make the things better or worse. Uh, what is important here in, in, this, in this chip is that those two transistors, M1 and M2, are the same. 
If you use a dual VT, for instance, with a pre-implanted channel, the characteristic of M1 and M2 will not be the same. The term thermal dependency will not be the same. You, here, and, and of course, the radiation effect will not be the same neither. The interest here of using the lens instead of a pre-implanted channel is about the fact that those two transistors are the same, and if something suffers from M1, it will also suffer from M2. And due to the fact that the radiation effect are independent of the transistor side, not the transistor doping, but the transistor side, then after it, it will make it independent. But if you implant, if you are making some different dual threshold transistor for M1 and M2, this is not working. Not it, it, it doesn't mean that it's not working at all, but it's less efficient. I I I hope I answer question. Yeah, sure. Um, we have a, a few more questions, so I'll be a little bit quick instead of commenting on them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Pedro Toledo from Polito and uh, Urgs asks this, um, on your analog blocks, um, do you know if performance versus radiation has been measured? Oh, yes. Um, everything that I show you are measurements. They are, it is not simulation. It has been measured. The measurement has been done in Belgium. Uh, the, the radiation has been done in Belgium with our friend of uh, Université Catholique de Louvain. And uh, the measurement has been done also partly in Toulouse, in France. So all the um, things I have shown you has been measurement that we have done by ourselves. It's not and on that question. Um, can you comment on um, what was the impact on performance of the radiation hardening? Uh, well, the the impact of um, performances. Um, well. To be honest, we just don't really know because we don't make any circuits without radiation hardening. This was uh, uh, this was uh, this design, the design, the two analog design that I've shown you has been done with ST Microelectronics uh, okay. in a collaboration ship, and they want us to develop these circuits directly for space application and to generate their own codes. So we just work on those one, uh, and uh, that's also why we use this uh, low cost technology, 130 nanometers make it cheap uh, as a replacement, for instance, of the LM324. That was the objective. Uh, so we don't look at make the circuit the more powerful or the more performances. The, the behavior was to make it radiation hardened and to obtain a minimum level of performances. And uh, so we don't know the addition of all those blocks uh, that was used for radiation hardening, do we have better performance if we don't use them? We don't know because we don't even try that. I'm so sorry. Okay, it's more like a project driven. Right. Let's, yeah, let's make it work. The application was definitely radiation hardening. So we don't make the radiation hardening and the non radiation hardening and the comparison of two. We don't make any kind of benchmark of this kind. We definitely design for radiation hardening and we have the, 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 the well, the goal was to obtain a band uh, uh, performances equal to the LM324. And that's quite easy because this, this operation on PFR is 40 years old. So it was easy to do that. But we want to do that with a radiation hardening nature. And that, that, that was the most critical things. And of course, certainly we have made some, some uh, um, let's say, uh, we decide to reduce a little bit the performances because of that. But um, and even then, when we have this technology, you can, you can make a very high performance uh, operational amplifier, much more powerful than the one we have done. But the problem is that this circuit has been made as a replacement of the actual transistor that the industry is using, and they want to replace it place to place. And if you put a operational amplifier which is much more efficient, then the circuits that were working can become unstable nowadays. So that's also, we were not able do that because we were not allowed to do that, neither with our industrial sure. partner. Um, we have another question from Paulo. Uh, his question is on the subject of t TID effects. Mm -hmm. So his question is, is there a difference between the degradation severity in analog and digital designs? Yes, uh, regarding total dose, yes. Um, well, it depends. It depends on the dose, actually, and the dose rate, of course. 
um, the, the dose that has a direct impact on analog because it shifts the threshold, so it shifts the, the biasing of the circuits. And sometimes the biasing of the circuits make the circuit functionality to collapse. Sometimes not, but sometimes. Most of the time it reduces it, and sometimes it just collapses. So that's analog, definitely they suffer from the very, very first day. From the digital, you got the noise merging. The noise merging is the point, the difference between a zero and a one. In the middle of, uh, of, of, of the scale, you got a zero uh, when you are close to zero volt, and you got a one when you are close to VDD. And in between, you got a margin, uh, which means that if you are going through an inverter, as soon as you don't reach this margin, a zero will still be considered as a zero, regardless it's a point one, for instance. Uh, and this, of course, will have an impact due to total dose because total dose make the VT of the P MOS and the VT of the N MOS changing on the opposite direction, which means that the noise merging is reducing with radiation. But you have to wait until this shift is large enough for the noise merging to disappear to start seeing problems. So it will take time. Um, but when it will arrive, it will be forever. So the circuit will collapse also at a given moment. But it will take time for that. And during that time, the circuit will still be available for digital, while the analog will start moving from the very first day. And that makes a lot of difference. <laughs> um, Paulo had a following up question, but you just answered it as well. <laughs> so I'm moving on. Um, we have a question from Clovis about materials. So his question is, um, is there any research on materials that would not be affected by radiation? I, mainly by total dose, I guess, in SEs. Yeah, the, the problem is that um, the, the problem is that it is due to oxide, actually, mostly oxide. And the oxide is always used is with actual uh, transistors. It's, it's, uh, it's more or less, uh, as I said in the, in the presentation, if you are talking about bipolar transistors, bipolar transistors, they are not officially relying on oxide, but there is passive oxide everywhere. So they got an effect, a second order effect. Uh, but the MOS, which is relying on oxide directly, as his name is saying, is suffering directly. So if we can have something which is oxide less, then it might work. But uh, to my knowledge, it doesn't exist. And uh, what we have is different sensitivity the gallium nitride are less sensitive than, uh, than, than silicon and things like that because the oxide are more or less used. But uh, the, the problem is that these, the energy of those particles is so high that you cannot avoid them to enter within the chip. And if the chip is not made of silicon, it will be made of something else, it will still suffer from that. It's a matter of radiation. Um, it's more or less sensitive, and of course, uh, that's also why the, and the satellite community is more focused on gas and GAN than silicon, because those ones are more robust by nature. But on the other hand, if you just use gas or GAN, you will not take advantage of processor, you will not take advantage of digital signal processing, and you will have trouble with adding some quality of service within your satellite. So there is no other firm that to use silicon to take advantage of the highest advanced technology we have, and that's a problem. Um, I heard about, I'm not sure about that, but I heard about our Russian colleague that was able to have a kind of, of, of um, a painting that will stop particles. Uh, I'm, I just heard about that. I've never seen, seen that by my own because, as you know, that uh, one meter of, of, of heavy metals will not be able to stop particles. It's really difficult to be sure that a little teeny piece of paint can stop it. But maybe I don't know. I've never. I heard about that. I've never been seen that. And if it if it exists, of course it will solve all our problems because it's just a matter of painting anything. Then it will make it radiation hardened forever. Um, but um, well, I hope it exists. But uh, if it exists, it's definitely military and uh, Russian today. So it's not available to anybody uh, at least today. Um, we have uh, one final question from the chat, and I have a question of my own. So uh, the two final questions, unless someone asks something on the chat. Um, this is from Rafael, and his question, um, I didn't quite understand it, but uh, I'm interpreting it. So I believe he asks, um, is, it, uh, is it a good idea to minimize circuit exposure to radiation by moving only parts of it to a safe area. 
Meaning, Ooh. not hardening everything, but only parts of it. Like, for example, the voltage reference or just the OPA, would that be enough for a circuit? Yeah, the, the question, I understand the question because this is something which is of dramatical importance. It's uh, it's not space electronics, but it's become when you got a nuclear accident some, somewhere. Um, do you have to send a, a drone or a robot with all the intelligence embedded? No, certainly not. You have to reduce it as much as possible, and then you can produce and, and wirelessly transmitted all the data to some electronics, which is out of a uh, radiation effect. If you can make it, that of course will be of great interest, which means that uh, it's, it's like um, uh, nowadays when, when you talk about edge electronics, the one which is very close to the application, this one, if it can be uh, reduced to minimum, that will of course make it less sensitive to radiation because the size of the chip definitely impacts the probability of, of receiving a particle of, of, of the dose which is received by the chip itself. It's the opposite of edge computing. You put all the intelligent clothes to the application to make the communication smaller. And here, because of radiation effect, you have to make the chip as simple as possible. And then you, print, you can send all the data to something else. And then if you can just have the minimum sensor plus a communication system and put all the intelligence in a safe place, of course, that would be much better. But for a, a space application, there is a problem with the link. The link is 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 quite poor and, and efficient. It's not poor efficient. It's several kilometers. But this approach of sending everything to the cloud instead of sending that to the chip itself is really can be of great help to go and save some nuclear plant that have an accident such as the one we observed in Yokoshima uh, a couple of years ago. And my final question is um, on the memory that you were talking about, about the, the sensing, radiation shift sensing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. my question is about 3D stacking. So oh, yeah. um, is it possible for a particle to actually cross a layer and hit the bottom layer or something like that? Yes, it crosses everything, unfortunately. The energy is so high. It, it crosses you really it cross everything. It will cross the overall satellite, not only the chip, the overall satellite. Boom. It can cross more than one meters of plumber. You know, boom, it's, it's, it's really high energy particle. It's heavy ions, so that those, those particles are really heavy. Well, of course, compared to a human being, especially in lockdown, that's not so heavy, but it's still quite heavy. And it got a very, very high speed, so the storage energy is really high. We call that high energy ion, high, heavy ion. And it will strike forever. It will, it will cross everything, including the satellite itself. So there is no way to shield the circuits, uh, even with 3D, except, of course, if the paint, to, the paint from the region is really efficient, which I don't know. So one option for the, for, for example, let's take a 3D memory. If we put just one layer of the phantom memory, let's say 10, 15 layers, I, I'm being like crazy, right? But let's say n layers and just one layer of phantom memory could solve the issue about the memory yeah maybe but you have to know the angle the particle arrived with to sure, know yeah. which are, and that may be a problem as well but at okay. the other end you know that something arrived which is already good you don't know exactly which chip which part of the chip but you know that something arrived and then you can take uh, the countermeasures that are required when a strike arrives that so that's already good news to have a single layer uh, of sensitive uh, cap sensor somewhere, that that's, that's can be more than zero for sure. But it will not be enough to protect everything because depending on the angle, you will not be able to say which part of the top layer has been altered by the particles. Perfect. Um, yeah, that was my last question. Thank you Thank so you. much, Ian. What a great my talk. Pleasure. It's a very okay. important um, subject. I'm really glad uh, we have all of you working on it. Um, thank you for our viewers, for our questions. And now we have um, a, a small break. We have an eight minute break. And then we are going to go to Crescendo's talk. So let me thank you again, Ian. We, we, we cannot clap for you, but let me thank you again in words. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to talk about radiation hardening by design. Take care. It was, 
It was my pleasure. Thank you.